Welcome to Stockholm Hardware 15, uh, this time on hardware in 2018. Thanks for coming. Uh, it took a little longer. Um, we have a slightly improved, hopefully improved uh, setup for uh, recording and live streaming. So uh, of course it didn't work ex exactly as planned. So hopefully, hopefully now it works. And uh, if you're downstairs uh, watching, uh, there should be no delay. And uh, if you have any audio problems, then uh, either shout out or just uh, run up the stairs and we'll fix it. Cool, so we have a very uh, awesome lineup for you. Um, there is uh, two main talks and eight or so lightning talks. And we have, uh, if you're interested, there's a makerspace uh, tour in the break. Um, it's gonna roughly look like this, of course, with about a 10 minute delay. Um, I will do a, try to do a brief welcome and uh, introduce uh, a few people who will give short uh, pieces of community news for you. Um, then we go to uh, the two main talks, uh, then we take a break, and then it's lightning talks. Lightning talks are, f are uh, five minutes max. Mm. Part of the new improved setup is uh, a sparkling yellow. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, briefly, um, Stockholm Hardware is about building a strong hardware community here in Stockholm. And uh, we are explicitly uh, trying to be embracing uh, of many different perspectives on hardware. So it, this is not for hardware people per se, it's for people who are interested in hardware from many different perspectives. Uh, whether you are beginning or you're experienced, startup or enterprise, an artist or an engineer or business people, and uh, we're a group of uh, volunteers, and it's nonprofit. Uh, this will be brief. Uh, we've done this for two years. This is uh, event number 15. Uh, we've run one workshop uh, a few months back. We did on Arduino. Anyone here that was at the workshop for Arduino? Two, three, four. Awesome. Four people there. I think we were maybe 30 or 40. Um, we'll do some more this year. We're about 1,800 uh, people uh, in the meetup group, uh, which is also uh, how you get the newsletter, if, if you want. And uh, we've taken uh, all the talks that we've had here, which is uh, about 100 uh, original talks, and they're now on the Stockholm Hardware website and on YouTube. Uh, there's a new website. You should uh, check it out. Um, it looks roughly like this. Uh, you can see a bunch of uh, videos from all the past presenters. And uh, I think one of the, the things that is quite interesting about the videos is uh, they, re they represent this diversity that I, that I talk about. If you go to the video section, you can list them uh, based on uh, whether it's a short or long presentation, whether uh, it's, it's, it's kind of whether it's about design or engineering or business, uh, and whether it's kind of like from a startup perspective, enterprise perspective, and so on. So check it out if you have a moment. Um, through the website, you can also reach uh, a list that is uh, procured by uh, the Nordic uh, Tech List, and it's a list of uh, hardware businesses in uh, startups that has a hardware component or is a hardware business in uh, Sweden and in Stockholm in particular. And it's interesting because uh, if you're into that type of stuff, then you, you get a quick overview of uh, what funding has happened in the hardware um, startup landscape. Okay, uh, briefly, uh, this is about 2018, so I'll say a few words about the plans for 2018 for us. Um, we have two new uh, partners uh, for, the, for the group. Uh, you can see both logos, I guess, down there in the bottom. Uh, it's m.new, uh, who is uh, it's a business, an online business, where you can buy um, electronics and smart home stuff. And we actually have some stuff to give away from them today, like the BBC Microbit, uh, Particle, Photon. We haven't decided how we'll give it out yet, but maybe it'll be a, a competition or, I don't know, we'll figure it out in the break. Uh, so they're one of the uh, partners, and the other partner is uh, Stockholm Invest, uh, who are, are looking to uh, position Stockholm internationally. Wait, was there more? Oh, yeah. Um, Mikael is going to come up shortly and talk about uh, a collaboration. Uh, you can stay up and, and wave. Uh, about a collaboration we have with uh, ID Action, uh, which is about uh, people who are interested in taking an idea into early stage uh, startup that has a hardware component. Um, so we'll have uh, some of that in future meetups. Uh, Caroline will do the Makerspace tour today. Where's Caroline? Hmm? Maybe she's downstairs. Maybe she's not here yet. Um, talked about that. 
And uh, today is also the first day with the new and upgraded uh, organizer team. Um, maybe you could just briefly come up and say something about yourself. We have Ted and Max and Lara. So maybe, uh, Ted, you can start. Hi. So I'll be presenting later, and I prepared a presentation then. So I'll just say, hi, I'm Ted. Uh, more later. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, I work at Electrolux and also I'm organizing Star Weekend uh, and a shout out, we have an event in February, so if uh, you are interested not only in hardware but also starting a startup, let me know or just check Star Weekend. And hi, I'm Max, I work with installations and sound in it art field and museums, going to do a short talk about that later too. Great. Um, I, well, I'm also one of the co-organizers. I'm the only one who doesn't rotate, um, so I get to, to, to stick around. Uh, we also have uh, Thomas, uh, who you may have met if you were here for last season. He's the only one who continues from the last season. Um, he is, I guess, more traditionally like in imbe embedded engineering. And uh, Susanne, who couldn't be with us today, uh, who works a lot with uh, innovation and enterprises and um, technology for uh, women and uh, girls. Okay, uh, logistics, food and drinks, uh, we're downstairs. Um, there's more beer uh, if we run out of it and there should be both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Uh, as you know, we're on this floor and the floor downstairs. Um, bathrooms, only bath, no, bathrooms are on this uh, upstairs level, there's two. And uh, if there's a crisis, I, there's a, a bathroom in the basement closer to Makerspace also. Uh, we'll do a break um, and during the break, if you're interested, you can go on the Makerspace tour with Caroline. Uh, we have a 100 people people limit up here, which I think we're just about hitting. Uh, thanks to Marek. Thank you, Marek. Uh, Marek uh, not only uh, uh, steers the camera, he helps me set it up, and he is the one who cuts all the uh, pieces of content into individual clips. So thanks a lot, Marek. Yay. <laughs> nice. Um, I already mentioned that we have an archive of uh, all the talks. Uh, there's a live stream. It uh, should be running uh, right now. So next time, if you're not here, you can catch it from home. I already spoke about our new partners. Um, and then uh, the third partner is Things. Uh, Things really helped us uh, get this set up. And uh, Things is the uh, co-working space for hardware startups that you're in now. And um, one of the co-founders will do a talk uh, later today about what's up for them in 2018. Oh, we have uh, Asta and Raphael uh, with us from uh, Things, and they are the ones who are helping ensure that uh, things are running smoothly. So if you see them, say thank you. Uh, next meetup is uh, live on uh, meetup.com. If you're interested, we haven't decided uh, what the theme is yet, but the date will be the 21st of uh, February. It's a Wednesday again. And um, if you'd like to do a lightning talk, uh, get in touch, and uh, we'll get you set up. Um, the way that we, we work the meetups is it's only really the main, the main speakers that has to be on the theme. So even if you don't know the theme, you can still sign up for a lightning talk. Okay. So that was my attempt at doing a quick welcome. I hope you feel welcome. Um, we're going to do um, a few community announcements. If you have something you'd like to say, uh, then you can come up here, take the stage for a minute. Uh, you're not uh, up here to sell anything, but if you have anything you'd like to share with the community, you're very welcome. Stuart, maybe you want to uh, do a, a little uh, improvisation. And a few people that already um, signed up ahead of time. And here's Perlin. And uh, I think, Perlin, unfortunately, I did not update the slide to be the latest version, but you're still very welcome to come up. Please give him a hand. Thank you. So, um, a little announcement uh, to this great community. Uh, we are a startup technology working around graphene. It's a film that uh, is showing some amazing properties. Uh, I think graphene, we know, uh, is recognized called sort of like a wonder material in many, many different ways. We have only identified a little small part around graphene, uh, but in a very important part, and that is heat dissipation. So, um, According to this statement, uh, you could, you know, get a uh, heat dissipation effect of up to 50% reduced temperature in, in consumer electronics and other electronic products. And that is what we are investigating. And we 
basically want to put the word out if there are people that are either working within graphene we're really interested to get to know you to exchange ideas and thoughts uh, or and or uh, if you're working in any area that is has a challenge with heat in developing products that's also something you know to discuss around so i'm going to be here exchange business cards or uh, linkedin profiles and uh, off we go i uh, hope uh, to meet some of you in the break thank you perfect time Cool. Um, I think we've got another one or two planned already. Uh-oh. Um, here's... Thank you, Laura. Frederick, over there. So, hi. I'm uh, Frederick Johnson, and uh, I work for a company called Hiax, Hardware Integration Acceleration Studio. So we just moved into this uh, uh, things uh, building. And we are developing a tool uh, for developing electronic hardware uh, so that you can reconfigure with this tool. And we are currently expanding. Uh, so we are looking for, for, for new people who, who want to join our team. So if you are um, interested in, 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 in joining this and you know something about uh, development and preferably then with some, some hardware uh, relation. <coughs> like embedded programming, but also developers for C++ and, and also web development. Um, feel, feel, feel free to contact me in the break. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully I will be able to talk more about this, uh, this uh, what the actually the project is about it on another meeting. Yeah. Great. <coughs> Uh, yeah, we were full for a lightning talks. Otherwise, we would have uh, loved to have you, Frederick, for, for, for a longer chat today. Um, for those of you who are interested in uh, video production, maybe you noticed this amazing uh, thing that happened on, on the screen with like, uh, like a recursive thing with funky colors. Uh, anyway, for the speakers, please stand up here on the podium because then we got a nice video camera shot of you. Uh, Kalle. Yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, have no fear. Sigfox is finally here. My name is Karl Lienhout. I'm the CTO of the Swedish Sigfox operator, uh, IoT Sweden. Um, I know that a lot of people have been waiting for the Sigfox uh, network to reach Sweden. Sigfox, for those of you who don't doesn't know it, is the world's largest IoT operator. So it's an operated network. Uh, it's really focusing on low energy with, with devices with battery lives of 10, 15 years not being uncommon. It's low cost, so we're talking about maybe 2 to 10 crowns, Swedish crowns, per device and month. Um, this is something that is extremely happening. Computer Sweden says that this is one of the most interesting things that will happen this year. What we are from the operator side really interested in is to talk to people like you, who are really interested in hooking up to the world's largest IoT network covering today 50 countries globally. So we are really interested in finding new corporations, new valuable and sustainable solutions and use cases. So, thank you. Cool, uh, was Tatiana gonna talk about uh, food tech? No. Yeah, okay, awesome. There's no slide for you, so uh, you're gonna have to deal with this. Okay, so I mentioned a bit when I was presenting myself, but uh, so uh, Startup Weekend is a 54-hour hackathon. We start on Friday with pitching ideas, then teams form, and we finish on Sunday with the prototype. Uh, so now we're doing, we, ha we have been in Stockholm since 2014, and it's a global network. Uh, we're having a next event, so we usually we have event every quarter, next event on food tech vertical. Uh, so if you are interested to see how to go from having an idea and pitching an idea to actually working in a team and realizing a product, uh, join us. If you have any questions, uh, come by me and I can answer them most probably. So if something, Google Start a Weekend and then you will find Start a Weekend Stockholm. Right, so that was not Tatiana, that was Laura. Okay, um, let's see, yes. <coughs> so in a moment, we're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna start the two, um, the, with the, we're gonna start the presentations and the talks and uh, Ted and Tobias are first. And we just heard a little bit about Sigfox and Sigfox, I think one of the things that Tobias will talk about in his main talk, which will be 
the first, right? Uh, but first, I mean before, even before that. <laughs> um, um, We'd love for all of you just to uh, uh, take a take a moment, uh, maybe take a few minutes to talk to the person next to you. Especially if it's uh, if you have two options, one of each side, and one of them you know, and the other one you don't know. You need to pick the one that you don't know, obviously, uh, because uh, part of the community, of course, is to meet new people who can help you with new ideas uh, or to get uh, some some things rolling. So maybe just say hello and maybe why you why you came here today, what you're hoping for. So take a few minutes for that. Okay, okay. So uh, that was fun. I love, uh, I love that moment when... Um, <laughs> I love the time when the silence is killed by everybody wanting to talk.
Okay. All right, guys. Let's get started. Tobias is waiting to get on stage, aren't you, Tobias? Good job. Um, hopefully, uh, there'll be enough for you to uh, continue your conversation during the break. Um, now, next up, we have uh, Tobias from WSI. So, um, and Tobias will talk about um, wireless in 2018. So, welcome, Tobias. Please give him a hand. Hello everyone, uh, great to see so many people. I, I think I've never seen so many people in this room before. Uh, so th that's uh, great. So my name is Tobias Sörlund. I work at a company called VSI, Wireless System Integrations. We are a, a design house that helps customers with product development. So I have just two slides on that. Uh, my background and why I'm here today is because my, my previous job before VSI was at a company, a, a small startup called uh, Conode, which made a, a LP1 technology with uh, six low pan. Uh, which is uh, actually one of the largest used LP1 technologies, but less known uh, LP1 technology in the world. So I will just touch on that a bit as well. But we decided, uh, just to give a glance what who we are. We are a company that has uh, small and large customers. Uh, we are in uh, com uh, products like Jail Dorman, uh, Husqvarna's uh, uh, robotic mo lawn motors. We have been in space uh, doing uh, satellites and... Um, uh, uh, Moon Rover, a bit on that as well. So been a bit all over the place. We uh, do three things. Uh, one is called business creation, where we help companies with the idea state, uh, all the way to innovate the business models, uh, validate them, build concepts, and later, in some way, uh, realize them for the customers. And then we go into the middle stage, where you can also do the product development. We also have a service to help customers with the mass production states. So if you need help with the setting up this, the uh, production in the EMSs uh, and for mass produ pr production, we can help with that and then hand over that relationship to you. But that's not where we are here today to talk about. So we're talking talk, talk about LPVON, Low Pi Wired Area Networks, which I guess everyone has heard about. Uh, I think it was said that 2017 should be like the, the big bang for LPVONs. I think it's equally right to say that on uh, 18. Uh, we this was a prediction made by uh, Vodafone, for example, that uh, things that I mean, LP1 in 2018 will be a massive disruption, which is they I think also said it for 17. So let's see what happens. Uh, before we go into some news about LP1, so I think it was good to have just a recap on the technologies that are out there today. So I picked a few. There are thousands out there probably, so I couldn't choose everyone, so I picked a few. Uh, start with the one that I started with off with six low pan. Have anyone heard about six low pan in LP1 uh, in, in, in that relation to before? Hand up. A few. Uh, that's good. So that's uh, LP1 technology used for then wide uh, as everyone wide area networks up to 10 kilometers in range, uh, hooking up uh, mostly smart meters and smart grid equipments in the world. So it's mostly used for ut utilities industry. It's one of the, the largest, I would say, in deployments. So it's uh, probably around uh, now 30, 40, 50 million units deployed in the world, uh, which is quite substantial compared to other technologies out there. If you can look at uh, Ingenue, how, ma how many have heard about that? Less? Yes? All right, perfect, thank you. Uh, it's a US-based company. It's a bit like Sigfox in a business model. So it's an operator-based network, but it can also de be deployed as a private network. Uh, it's using 2.4 gigahertz though, so it's a bit different than uh, Sigfox and sub-gig uh, technologies. Then we have Vaviot. Hand up again. You know everything, probably. Uh, sub-gig technology. Uh, then we have uh, LoRa, uh, of course. Everybody heard about that, I guess. Uh, weightless, uh, not so many, one, two, maybe. Uh, so I, I put some of the private networks there and some operator-based uh, networks here. And you see that LoRa is in both because that's also um, a technology that can be deployed as uh, a private and also there are companies that has that as an operator-based model as well. But then we have some interesting upcoming technologies. Uh, the uh, cellular base from uh, GCMA, the MBIUT and, and CATS, uh, which uh, is starting to get uh, a move in the market. We're going to go into that a bit later as well. And then we have Wi-Fi Halo. Have you heard about that? No? So it's Wi-Fi for long range, or longer range at least. Uh, and then we have Bluetooth. 
with long range experience, which I think is extremely interesting to see that you can actually have Bluetooth for long range, uh, which all of us uh, anyway has in our mobile phones. So it will be quite interesting when that picks up speed. So uh, the next few slides are about announcements and news on the different technologies. So we start with, uh, with Sigfox. Uh, I think what they launched 2017, in the end of 2017, was a simplified model, you could say, uh, on how to utilize their network. So they, they launched a couple of new services, or repackaged services, uh, and these are, made, uh, I would say, the main three. Uh, the Ivory, which is now uh, a way to uh, uh, make it possible now to do even more decrease the price, I would say, uh, and uh, simplify more or less the, the, the onboarding uh, for, for the network. The Monarch uh, is a way to uh, automatically provision the devices to let them uh, have the configuration they need to enter different markets to make it easier for the deployments to, to happen. And the Atlas, which is a, a repackage of their uh, previous service for, for location-based services, but with some add-ons, so make it even more simple now to, to have also uh, location-based services on, on Sigfox. Uh, we have some advantages and disadvantages there that uh, is good to put up. Uh, as everybody knows, it's, it's a great uh, range with Sigfox. Uh, as we heard before, it is the, the cost of devices are, are extremely low. Uh, the network availability, as you also said, is, is good. It's, you cover quite a lot of countries right now. But also have a dis some disadvantages, or at least things you should consider when you consider technology for your use case. And that is, of course, that it is a very, very narrow band network. So you can only transmit quite little data. You can also only transmit a few times per day compared to other networks, maybe. And there is a risk, potential risk, that is a single vendor network compared to other technologies which have maybe, maybe more players there. Uh, if you take the next one, we go into six Lopan, which is a, I had to put it up for because it's my previous baby. But it's also, uh, I think, it's interesting to talk about because this is the only network that gives you more or less a straight IP uh, address to your end device. So it's just extension of the internet. So it's extremely simple to, to address the devices and talk to them uh, as they were in any other uh, thing on the internet. Uh, it's basically mostly used for in, in, in LP1. Uh, relationally as a mesh network, as of the other networks are mostly our point-to-point -point star networks, uh, which makes it also very easy to deploy and, and very uh, cost-effective to deploy. It's a mature technology, it's been there for about 10 years. Uh, we've had it in Sweden and, and Finland for the last 10 years in, in our smart meters, about a million of them in Sweden and Finland. Uh, they also have some disadvantages though, because it's, it's not... Uh, it's a pure open standard by the IETF, so it's completely open, Mo probably one of the most open standards. But there is no large entity driving the standard. So there is a low degree of interoperability between vendors of the solution, which is a big, big problem of it. And uh, uh, there is one organization called Wison, uh, which works for the utility and smart grid industry that, that more or less drives it from with some US-based uh, company support. So what they're trying to do and announced in 2017 was that now they are making interoperability between the LMS, which is a smart meter standard for uh, packaging the, the a, a protocol more or less for, for smart meters. Uh, and what is really interesting, maybe can shift the way that there's no large entity driving the standard, is that India uh, has more or less mandated this for all their public smart meters, which for 2020 is a target of 50 million, but the real target is 200 million smart meters. And if that happens and if that doesn't change, that would be an extremely interesting way of, of pushing real internet all the way out to the device. So we'll see. The next one is LoRa. Uh, how many have heard about LoRa? <laughs> ah, that was good, that was great. Uh, LoRa had a big disadvantage before. And we, we talked about it before uh, with uh, Mr. Sigfox here. Uh, that you can't roam uh, LoRa, for example, between networks. So uh, I guess that was on top of the work, um, uh, the, the working group's uh, backlog to features to add. And they, re they actually launched it now 
a way to roam LoRa devices over different networks and different geographies. Of course, this needs to be also enabled by the service providers and allowed that to happen, but it's now possible in the standard. We saw a very large increase of, of LoRa products last year, about 176% increase, which is quite good, I think. Uh, they also have some advantages and disadvantages, of course. Uh, the advantage is that it can also be deployed as both a public, meaning an operator-based model, but also as a private network for, for uh, uh, campus installations and so forth. The availability of hardware is quite good. Uh, there are many people that work with LoRa, uh, and your hands is a proof of that, I guess. And, but the disadvantage is that you have a high downstream latency, for example, so it's hard to maybe to push an over-the-air update of a large firmware, for example, which is maybe ma mandated in, in many use cases. Uh, and, and other things, you like to download data to the device. So what about then on BIoT and, and CAT-M? So is 2018 now the, the, the comeback in LP Vans for, for operators? Do you think that? Anyone that think that? Uh, raise your hand. You see? One. Maybe two. So I did some, uh, some investigations uh, on uh, the current uh, deployment or interest in NBIT and CATMs. Uh, the middle one is, is Europe, uh, you could say. Uh, you, can, you can read yourself, but what you can see of this picture is that many of the operators have a plan. Uh, you can say that the U.S. are more on maybe CAT M's, I would say, than, than uh, MBIoT. Europe, you see a lot of pilots and, and more interest in, in MBIoT. And in Asia, they have come a bit more longer when it comes to those uh, narrowband technologies than we have in the rest of the world right now. But you have pilots in Sweden, both uh, Telenor and Tele2 tele as, as pilots, so you can go in and, and try to uh, actually saying that you can in the cells that you are of have of an interest, they can deploy MBIT as of today. So that's quite in interesting to see. But it's still a few years back to, to have a global rollout. Uh, one operator I talked to so that you should expect between five to seven years in the future before this is a global recognized thing you can use globally. So it's still a few years to go. So what happens with other networks then? Uh, First, some, some uh, NBIoT and CATMs uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Is done. So, the common ways, of course, is that when this happens, it will be a normal economy of scale. So, the, the prices of these things will go down. We'll see if they go down in the same levels as uh, Sigfox, for example, but it at least has the potential to go down quite much. You have another type of, of um, uh, you maybe the trust issue with, with having a, an operator there is larger if you, you maybe trust the operator more than a private network maybe, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting. The scalable, scalable and reliability of the network, I mean it comes with SLAs that you have with the operator. But we still see that it probably will be more costly than, than uh, other LP1 technologies out there. So we, 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 I would say that we expect that the price, the total cost of ownership is still higher than, than some of the LP1 technologies. And the need of network certifications, which you maybe not need in, in other lp will be a barrier for some, especially small startups, potentially. Uh, I don't know if you know the difference between MBIoT and CATM, but I just uh, I think that's the only technology slide I have today with numbers on. Uh, but uh, you could say that, as you see, MBIoT is more geared towards really narrow band uh, things, and and CATM for a little bit more of, of bandwidth. Uh, but also, it's a big difference I think is that CATM can uh, carry a TCP, TCP IP link, and MBI cannot. And the other one which is really big is that MBIoT is not a mobile solution. You can uh, move it, uh, and when it goes down, it can up and, and uh, connect to a new uh, cell, but it's not a mobile solution that can have a cell, ha cell handover technology. Uh, so then you need to, to go for CATM, for example, instead. If you look at the other ones then, 2G and 3G, soon time to let those go. Already now, AT&T has stopped this new certification of 3G modems in the US. So it's no time to start considering another technology as these two. So when we design new products for our uh, customers, we take this a lot in cons consideration right now, what we should choose as a cellular technology. 
So, how do I choose? It's not a simple one, uh, I can tell you that. I, I think it's quite hard. But it, there are a few maybe categories that you should consider when you, when you are in this choice. I put down some, there are pr probably more. When cost, then you can have look at the, the model cost, you should look at the total cost. You should look at the, the infrastructure cost if you need to uh, deploy maybe a private network yourself or if you go with a subscription model like, like Sigfox. Uh, longevity, uh, what are the risks of this technology? Will it be surpassed by MBIoT when it comes? How, how long will it live? And so forth. Uh, is it based on standards or not? And so, and so forth. If you look at the history, you can say that, I mean, open standards has surveilled the most. So we'll see if that also happens in, in this LP1 technology things. Performance, maybe it's the easiest one, I would say, because uh, you, you probably know quite a lot with your use case and how much data I will to drive. So it's maybe most more tangible to, to have as a uh, uh, th thing to evaluate. And reliability, I mean, how, and that's everything. I mean, is it the license or unlicensed, so can I, uh, do I, should I expect interference from other technologies in, in sub-gig bands, for example? Uh, what's the maturity? Can I do all the security requirements that I have for my use case, and et cetera, et cetera? So these are just a few things that uh, you can uh, use as a, as a choice matrix, you could say. So that's it, more or less. Ah, good timing. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so any questions maybe? Yes, one. Weightless. What's the point of weightless? The one LP want to rule them all. At least that's what they say themselves, try to say themselves. Well, uh, what's the point of uh, weightless? Well, I mean, that it's what's the point of Sigfox? What's the point of Sigslopan? I, I it's hard to say why, but I mean, it's another one which has probably their, their unique selling points. So uh, I'm not an expert in waitlist myself, but hmm. anyone else can answer that question maybe. Why waitlist over something else? Hmm. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Um, I, sure, I understand. Uh, but shouldn't that also be maintenance? <laughs> so uh, the the question was that uh, I listed Sigfox uh, as a single vendor to be a risk, uh, as a disadvantage, uh, and uh, for Sigfox to be one company. Yeah, of course, because you have speed and you have easier ways to imp implement new features and, and put them on the market. So, absolutely, yeah. But also it's probably more uh, uh, easily disturbed if another technology comes and not maybe so f uh, um, commonly used in other, for other companies um, if that happens. So that's the reason why I put it there. Any more questions? Great, happy to be here. Um, I guess the contacts are on the homepage if you have more questions or something. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, yeah, as, uh, as Tobias said, um, all the presentations will be on the, uh, on the Stockholm Hardware website. It takes us about a week or, or, or so to put it up there. Um, if it's too warm uh, up here or downstairs, um, we can open some windows. So um, how, how are you doing up here? Should we open some windows? Anyone? Hands up for Windows? A few? Okay. Maybe you can like open up like a local window over there. <laughs> and oh, you did? <laughs> Stina, that's an amazing idea. Max is on it. Yep. Okay. Uh, same for you downstairs. Um, Ted. Ted is next. Uh, please welcome Tex to T Ted to talk about what happened at uh, CES. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Ted. Uh, I was up on stage uh, earlier very briefly, now a, a slightly longer presentation. Um, my last name is Person, um, and I'm a partner at Equity Ventures, which is the VC arm of a private equity company here in Stockholm uh, called EQT. And we've been operational for 
a uh, year and a half, um, roughly. And if you would like to follow me on Twitter, that's my name with an at sign before. Uh, Eek Adventures, um, live since a year and a half. We've done uh, investments in, I think, 23 companies. Uh, some of those uh, having a, a hardware angle. I, I know there are people from iFlow here tonight. Uh, another company called Vario, which I'm on the board of, which is a Finnish high-resolution VR company. I'm also on the board of uh, 3D Hubs, which uh, maybe per se is not a hardware company, but they're in the additive manufacturing space. And they just uh, gave out uh, the 3D printing handbook. So if, you're, if you want a copy of that, uh, shoot me uh, a note uh, somewhere. And soon asked me to um, have a, a, a brief chat about uh, my experiences from, uh, from CS this year. Uh, Consumer Electronics Show um, in, held in Vegas uh, every year. I think this was my seventh or eighth year. I only missed one in that, in that stint. And there are 180,000 people going to this, uh, to this event in, uh, in Vegas. And um, uh, when I started thinking about what to present here, uh, two things uh, came to mind. There were a lot of new TVs uh, announced and a lot of uh, massage chairs <laughs> announced. So with that said, uh, end of uh, presentation. Uh, no, I, um, I, I put five different sort of observations or five different chapters uh, into this presentation. It's very hard because it's such a big, such a big conference. Um, the first one, which I think was the dominating theme this year, was, uh, was voice. Voice everywhere. Um, and out of the voice players we have, uh, meaning uh, I would say Google and Amazon, maybe and with, with Microsoft and, and Apple as, as runner-ups, uh, Google was the dominating one. And I think it's because their ecosystem is, uh, is for free. You can in, uh, include a, a Google Assistant into whatever technology you want, uh, and it's pretty, pretty simple. But they were everywhere. Um, there was a big announcement that uh, they partnered with LG, with Sony, with Lenovo. So it didn't matter where you went, uh, there was a Google Assistant uh, integration made. Um, one of the most interesting ones, I think, was this uh, smart display from Lenovo with, uh, with Google Assistant, which, uh, which is very similar to the uh, Amazon Echo with the, uh, with the display that came out last year. But it was everywhere. This is the LG lineup with, uh, with fridges and washing machines and uh, the small robot they have as an assistant, everything with, with Google Assistant built in. Another cool thing was the Optoma uh, 4K projector with, with Alexa. Uh, which actually worked uh, because it's kind of bulky with a with a with a beamer or the infrared to sort of point at it and stuff like that, and it, it really really worked. Um, and a lot of other companies uh, either integrating the existing vendors or like Mercedes creating their own. So Mercedes had a big booth and a big presence around their Mercedes-Benz user experience vision. And they were mocked a lot by the media because uh, their way of interacting with this built-in voice assistant was, hey, Mercedes. And they were just like, come on. <laughs> Maybe something slightly more innovative. Uh, so that was number one, voice. Um, and speaking about cars, um, cars everywhere. Um, and this is pretty new. I think three years ago, we started seeing the automotive companies coming to, to see us. Before, they were in Detroit, and they were in New York on the auto shows there, in Geneva here in Europe. But uh, there are automotive everywhere. And um, obviously, uh, autonomous was uh, a huge theme. Um, this is one of the bigger announcements. This is GM's announcement of that they will be putting out a fleet of autonomous uh, Chevy uh, vaults um, with no steering wheel. I think it's still on the, on the Jimicky side, but I think um, it's, it's one of the more concrete, concrete ones. Another theme was that you see a lot of premium, um, especially electric vehicles from outside of the US and outside of Europe. So this one uh, was, I think, one, one of the, the players that, that made the biggest splash. It's, uh, it's a Chinese company called Byton, and it's a, a luxury electric SUV. SUV. Uh, very premium on the outside, even more premium on the inside. And of course, this is CS, huge display and it tracks your emotion and everything. And I, I saw it and it, the display worked, but what was on the display didn't really uh, work. It was an animation pretty much, but, uh, but very, very cool. Um, another player that caught my eye was, was Honda. They also announced uh, a line of autonomous uh, robots slash vehicles, something like that. Some of them look like robots, like the, uh, 
the ones to um, to the left. But the one that really caught my attention the most was uh, was the one here uh, to the right, which is kind of like a quad, but without a driver's seat. And it's a modular uh, platform. So the idea is uh, that you can equip it with uh, with different uh, different plugs, uh, so you can turn it into a farming machine or uh, utility tool or um, whatever that is. And <laughs> I want one. I don't know why. <laughs> but the absolutely coolest thing in the I don't know if this is a car, but in the vehicle space was uh, Toyota's e pallet concept, and this also won all the best in shows by the tech tech websites. So it's, it's hard to display, uh, to, to uh, nail what it is. They, they call it the multi-purpose moving space, which is kind of vague. Uh, so it's anything, uh, and it can, can come to you. So it could be a, a, a workplace. Maybe you could just be in the sofa, but okay, a workplace that comes to you so you can work. It could be like a food truck. It could be a, an advertising space. It could be a, a restaurant. It could be basically, basically anything. Um, so I think it's kind of an innovative vision of what the future uh, could be like, but maybe a bit um, uh, gimmicky. So that was number uh, number two, uh, cars everywhere. Moving on to uh, number three, and this is about uh, immersive computing. So a few years back, VR was everywhere at CS. Uh, this year, VR had moved into the background, and AR was was everywhere. Uh, uh, one could say so. On the on the VR side, there were some interesting announcements. HTC announced their uh, Vive Pro with a slightly better uh, display and wireless capabilities, but the real innovation was in VR. And, and the, the coolest gadget I saw there was um, the V6, uh, who has been a leader in this space for a long time, and they managed to shrink the, uh, the goggles down into a form factor that is almost acceptable, I would say. It's still on the Google Glass side. It looks like wearing a Segway in, in, your, in your face somehow. <laughs> But it uh, maybe 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 next generation, and as we know, Apple is working on something, and yada yada yada. So um, yeah, a lot of lot of AR. Um, fourth, um, beyond hardware, and I think this is a movement that we've seen the last years as well. So there are more and more non-hardware companies uh, present. Um, so this year there was a huge haul just for non-hardware startups. Uh, so I think this is starting to become like the epicenter, not just for consumer electronics, but for, for, for tech on a, on a wider scale. So uh, as, as a VC, I cover Europe mainly, but it's, it actually makes sense for me to fly to Las Vegas because there are more than 500 European startups brought there by various uh, European startup associations in one hall. So I could just walk around and, and cherry pick, which was good. Um, and fifth, uh, the category for everything I couldn't fit into any of the other categories, I call it random. So these are just some interesting things I, I, uh, I saw there. And I, I started talking about TVs, so I had to at least uh, have, uh, have one or even two TVs. I think this one was kind of cool, it was called The Wall. It's, uh, it's by Samsung, and uh, in the configuration they showed it, it was a 146 inch modular micro LED display. And what's cool about this is that it's made up of five by five centimeter blocks. So you can configure this however you want. You can build super big displays or small displays and displays that do not fit the, the normal form factor as a ratios of, of a TV. So that was cool. Um, LG uh, wanted to do something different, so they had a rollable OLED. And this is one of those innovations that they really tried to, wh what should we make out of it? Uh, can we bend the phone? Can we bend the TV? And here they have a concept which, where the, the, the TV rolls down into its base like this, which uh, you know, kind of kind of cool maybe. It got a lot of attention there because it's almost like magic because it feels like it's just rolling down and then it just uh, disappears. Uh, Sony Aibo is, is back. I don't know if you remember this from from the um, uh, shift of the millennia, this uh, robot dog that they discontinued five, six years ago. Uh, it's back, and everyone thought it was cute. I don't know uh, what it's for, really. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, Racer uh, also made a big splash. Every year they have, um, have a new prototype. They had uh, a project called the, uh, the Linda this year, which is, in essence, uh, a dock for their new Racer phone. So you just plop the Racer phone into the... Uh, into this base, and it becomes the the, um, the trackpad of the of the computer, and you can carry it around. And I thought it was cool until my girlfriend had joined me. She's like, "What? What if you need to use the uh, the phone?" <laughs> so it's, a, it's not a multitasking uh, device. I still think it's cool though. 
Speaking about gaming, Razer is a gaming company. Uh, NVIDIA, they, uh, they're blurring the lines between monitors and TV. So they released the line of 65 or 55, 65, 75 inch gaming displays, which are all 120 hertz. So they're, they're good for gaming, which I think is, is pretty cool now when displays are, are cheaper. Uh, one of the weirdest ones, a ping pong robot that never lost. I, I tried to play against it, and it got like this super creepy voice uh, heckling you uh, all the time. I'm not sure I would get permission to have one of these at, uh, at home, though, but it's uh, yeah, pretty cool. Um, this one was, was very nice, maybe not uh, as, as the last one. This is um, uh, a duck, uh, which is designed for uh, hospital use for, for sick kids. So they can relate to uh, what they're going through, uh, both in terms of emotions, but also in terms of w treatments and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, maybe not the, the most innovative tech, but a very, very nice, uh, nice packaging. Um, holograms, I think this one's kind of cool. Uh, wh whoops, whoops. Whoops. Here we go. Uh, Kinomo Hypervision, so it's in essence a propeller, and it just uh, with o an OLED on. But since it uh, uh, spins so quickly, the uh, um, illusion is that it's uh, a hologram that floats in midair. So some Blade Runner effect for you. So one of these propellers is three hundred um, three hundred dollars, uh, meaning you have to put together a, a lot of them to to create something uh, cool. Um, these have been out for, for some time, but now they're, they're getting affordable. I thought they were cool. Uh, and then Netflix did, um, did a stunt there. So they, they were launching a new series called Altered Carbon. So they had uh, a fake booth for Psychisec or, or something like that. And they fooled, I think, uh, no one, but uh, still, still kind of cool. And I think the, the, the thing that most people will remember from, from, from this year's uh, CS, what that was that halfway through there was a big blackout. So every piece of tech just stopped, uh, stopped working. And first people were really afraid actually because of what happened in Vegas previously. But then people like, just started talking to each other and not just looking around. So I think there's like a unique experience. And then someone um, started making a joke because previously Kodak had launched uh, their cryptocurrency effort. So someone said that Kodak had just plugged their, their miner in and stolen all the, uh, stolen all the energy. So that was, in essence, uh, my four plus one observations. And on the slightly more serious, serious note, what, what I think is interesting with CS is that everyone goes there, uh, and it's sometimes hard to, to sort out whether a new innovation, a new product, is this the future of this company? Is this like a board meeting thing? Or is, or is this something that th this company did just because they could? So Samsung, oh, we make screens. We make uh, ARM processors. We 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 make voice stuff. Let's sh plug it all together into one thing. They, they just do stuff because they can, or is this just a marketing marketing stunt? So it's all three of those, and sometimes it's hard to to know which is uh, which is which. But I think that's what makes CS so uh, so uh, so interesting. So that was it. Uh, my name is Ted, and uh, maybe if anyone would have any questions, otherwise there's a break, right? Yeah. Okay. No questions. One question. Yes. Okay. So Vario, the company we invested in that I talked about in the beginning. Are they a representation of VR moving into the enterprise environment? Uh, and my answer is, I think, yes. More of that in my five minutes lightning talk. <laughs> Perfect. Looking forward. <laughs> no, but uh, sh sh yeah, so uh, since we have time, so what Vario is, it's, um, it's in essence, they're, they're hacking the way uh, we, we see. So there's a super high resolution display, which is very small. And that is overlaid onto a background display, which is kind of like normal re resolution VR display. Ooh, cliffhanger. I knew that Jeremy finished. Good. So, so when you look around, there is like gaze tracking, and then it's moving the super high resolution screen around. So the, the illusion is that the resolution of this VR and mixed reality headset is 
human grades, like 100 megapixels, while HTC Vive uh, Pro that came out now is like between five, yeah, four, four or five, something like that. So that's it. So looking forward to, uh, to more in your talk about that. So what, what felt most out of date? Um, That's a good question. I don't know. In a way, the whole setting with like a lot of people going to a place looking at stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, all the TVs, I guess. It's just the same thing over and over again, I think. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ted. And uh, so uh, there's a break in a moment. Um, and um, two things uh, I wanted to do before that. Uh, I wanted to first uh, ask, I forgot to ask if there was anyone that wanted to do um, like on the spot community announcements, if anyone wanted to come up for a minute and talk about something. Stuart, did you want to say something or you're all right? Okay, cool. And if there's anyone else that wanted to uh, come up for a, a one minute community announcement, feel free. It was my mistake to, to forget or we'll skip over it. Uh, yeah, there's a new language that might be very interesting for hardware guys. It's been launched by Tibco, and it's called Flogo. And it's a very compact uh, language, and watch out for it because see how it develops. But it's a new guy on the block, but it's much smaller footprint. And we're talking about AI actually working on microcontrollers, TensorFlow, things like that. So that's what they're interested in. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> Short and quick. Uh, and uh, Stuart also made a few comments on the uh, meetup.com uh, event page. So if you have some comments, you can also uh, drop them there. Um, anyone else? No? Nope. Uh, for other events you come, uh, you feel free to uh, come up. If you have something you want to share with the community, you can come up for a minute. Uh, then before we go, uh, Caroline, are you? Yep, there you are. Caroline, do you want to come up and just uh, briefly say what you're going to be up to? Here's Caroline. So I, um, if anybody has not been to the Stockholm Makerspace, it's host in the basement of this building. And the best way to show the Stockholm Makerspace is to be at the Stockholm Makerspace. So please join me downstairs. It's two floors down uh, in the cellar. It's 300 square meters. We have everything ranging from laser cutters to 3D printers to welding facilities to uh, uh, woodwork, metal, textiles, textiles thank you, um, a wet room, this is pretty much everything, so welcome. Great, so um, are you, uh, should people follow you or how do you want to do it, Caroline? Yeah, so if you want to uh, go for a tour, I think it's going to be like 15 minutes or so, so we're going to start again when it's 7.30 um, with uh, all the lightning talks. Okay, bye.
Last time we saw each other, it was at the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was right at the end, right? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. 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 Well, March 1st, I'm uh, going back uh, proper. Yeah. So that
All right. It is already a few minutes past uh, time. So um, let's get rolling. So if you're downstairs and you want to come upstairs, please uh, wait, make your way. And uh, we'll get started with um, all the lightning talks. Is there any word on whether Caroline is back with the team from the uh, tour? No? Anyone back who's been on a tour? You have? Okay, awesome. Okay, that was a better way to ask the question. Okay, so the tour is done. Thanks, Marek. Um, cool. Let's do this as a warm-up. Um, please uh, take out your phones. Um, go to this URL, menti.com, and put in this code of 342151. And um, then we'll get a little bit of a feedback. Uh, this is the first of uh, several questions. And it's a way for us uh, to get some input from you about uh, how our rents, how they run, uh, and what you're interested in. So pretty please um, take this opportunity to take out your phone without being rude to the presenter. I won't take offense. Okay, who's been to more than 10? Oh, wow. Two. Oh, yeah, right. It's familiar faces. That's uh, impressive. Uh, I imagine uh, there might be uh, a few drop-offs that have uh, left uh, in the break. But looking at the crowd here, I'd say probably 40. Is there is there anyone downstairs still? Yeah. There is? Okay. If you're sitting downstairs, uh, then you should also open up your phone and go to Mendimeter. Oh, is my uh, face shot just in, in on top of the counter? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Mm. Okay, 46, that's good. Um, this is actually pretty common uh, that um, between a third and half of the people here uh, are here for the first time. That's pretty common. Um, so that's, uh, I think uh, part of what it should uh, may maybe make you realize is that uh, it's, not like, it's not like this group is for, for somebody else. This, this group is, is for you just as much as it is for, for everybody else. And uh, here's another uh, way to uh, get a bit of a sense of uh, who's here and who you can meet, who you can learn from and talk to. Uh, you can be creative if you, uh, yeah, right. Uh, the person who is babysitting autonomous trucks, are you by any chance doing a presentation later about something? Yeah. All right. Mm, it might be one of you two. Yeah, I thought that might be. Okay, yeah, so one of the lightning talks uh, is about the uh, robot championships of 2018. No babysitting. Okay, 56, that's cool. Uh, I think uh, what I, what, what I uh, enjoy when I look at uh, this list of uh, what people uh, focus on in day-to-day -day is uh, the diversity, that there is no kind of simple way to define uh, who this group is. Uh, it's a pretty broad group of people. So there's a lot for us to learn from each other. Um, yeah, so we're starting a new season, and uh, with a new group of uh, organizers, we're discussing what to focus on. Um, so if you have some thoughts on what you'd like uh, a future meetup to be themed on or, or focused on, then uh, please share. And there's one more question after this, and then it's over. <laughs> yes, in fact, we had one already on robotics, but uh, just because we've done it already doesn't mean we can't do it again.
Is ESP32 a Wi-Fi chip or what is that? Stuart, it was it wasn't loud enough for me to hear it, but I fear that if you, I, if I could hear it, I don't think I would understand it. It was some chip thing. Mm, okay. Who knows what ESP32 is? That is solid. Okay. So it's not, what, could one of you, one of you come up? So this was like for 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 you who couldn't see the crowd. It's like a third, at least a third, if not half the crowd. So somebody come up here and explain to to me and everybody else what this ESP32 is. Ah, I see. It's an alternative to ARM processors. Okay, got it. Quantum computing, cool. Great. Uh, we'll have a think on this. And I think the last one. Yes. Uh, now, of course, the event is not over, but I fear that by the time it's over, you're going to want to leave. So uh, I was hoping to drop this in now. Uh, would love to hear, um, of course, things that you're happy about, but in particular, things that you'd like to improve. Uh, so um, if you could please share. Uh, that's nice. <laughs> but also, Max is doing a lightning talk later, and uh, that's going to be even greater. Max, did you bring anything to demo? Did you bring like a physical thing in Gizmos? Where's Max? Uh, Don't know. No, okay. Vegan food, right, okay. Was it only vegetarian, what was down there? Yep, okay. Good point. And we ran out of food too. When I was down, okay, I see. Was there too little food before we started the event or later? Later. Yes, so if you're not there from the start, you're out of luck. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah, more hands-on. Uh, in general, I, I really would uh, welcome any thoughts or ideas that any of you have on how we can encourage people more to share uh, kind of show and tells or anything that you recently worked on and just come up and present it. Um, in fact, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I still haven't figured out how we're going to do this, but like we have this gear and we're going to have some gear at every meetup going forward. Right now it's the micro bit um, and the particle photon and there's an Arduino and we're going to give it away. So the idea is to try to encourage us to be more hands-on. Um, so anyway, ideas on that is uh, very welcomed. I should have added like a, a last uh, question, which was like your name so that we could um, pick one of you for the hardware giveaway, but uh, I'll come up with something else. A joke? Uh, does like a hardware joke? <laughs> okay, that might be. Uh, maybe a joke involving like the theme of uh, one of these then. Um, okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, next up, I think, is um, I feel like Magnus, is Magnus here? He wanted to um, get on stage there. Please welcome Magnus, who is uh, the co-founder of Things. Thanks, Suna. Good to see all of you. I'm so happy to be here again. This is actually my favorite days of Things, and I spend a lot of days here, so this means a lot. Uh, it very few projects that are initiated actually comes out far beyond imagination, and Stockholm Hardware is actually one of those. Primarily thanks to Sune and the guys. Anyway, this is important. We have so many new people I learned every time, so I will tell you also the background of things so you know where we actually are. So I spent a lot of years in IoT and trying to build an industry out of IoT in Sweden. And you know the T in IoT means things. I mean, most people forget that. We would like to, oh, we want to do, you know, big data, we want to do this and that. But without things, nothing really happens. And things, since I was an investor in the past, I know people don't want to invest in things. It's very difficult to do business on things. And things meaning hardware, actually meaning everything that relates to nature, you know, the real world. It's quite easy to scale a business across the globe if you deal with kind of funny money or, you know, music or something that's not really the real world. But as, as soon as you get into the physical world, it becomes really complicated. Certifications, what you have in stores, shipping, blah, 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 culture, colors, it's very difficult. So the idea was to, to in order to boost the whole kind of position of Sweden as a good IoT country, we should actually focus much more on things on the real world, on, on hardware, and on industry, 
because in Sweden we live out of industry. So we always forgot that we actually everything we built here is coming from forests, mining, and water. Engineers turn that into products. We learned how to sell that abroad. We are gifted with no people, so we just had to go abroad. So that's the short story of, of why we're here and why it works to the way it works. So we founded this, and we said, so how do you do it? Well, we need a house, because if you work with the real world, you need somewhere to meet. So, you know, it's the physical world. So we said, we're going to have a house. And we found this place. Akademiska Hus uh, offered us to, to rent it for three years. Uh, quite okay. And we hired Linda, our CEO. I don't know if she's still here. She runs the place. And, and we turned it around, like, to become what it is in, in about five months. And we started to say, so how do we fill up the house with something? Well, if, like when you throw a good party, you, if you invite the coolest people on earth, you know, all the others will be there as well. So the whole idea is to build an atmosphere here that's really, really, really cool and that people like and so forth. So we started to handpick, really, a couple of really, really cool companies. I think the first one we went to was Bolimento. We said, they are the stars at the moment. Let's bring them here. So the first company who moved in here was Bolimento. And then it became very easy, actually, to fill up the, the rest of the slots. There's about 150 kind of seats at things. So 150 people kind of works here. Today we have 53 member companies. Uh, we have about 90 altogether with those who left already. So it's a, it's a good kind of flow of companies going and back and forth. We don't invest anything in companies, so we don't care if they go bust or not because we only bring the good people here. So we know if they, if they, you know, if they fail, <coughs> they will come back in another company very soon, which has happened many times already. Now the, the other big thing is that we also try to bring in the industry here in order to really f solve the core of the problems with hardware, which is that if you can, if you are small with hardware, you will probably never be big because it takes too long to scale out. So you have to find a way to get to kind of massive, massive volumes or massive impact by working with somebody who have all those muscles, which means the big companies. If you're a big company, you have no clue to even control your own domain any longer. All the innovation comes from store small, companies, so they have to learn how to work with people like us here. So therefore we have recruited in different ways at a lot of large corporates here as well. We have all about 40 now, we have different types of memberships and partnership, but there's about 40 of the largest companies in Sweden and some international are also active here now. And we spend all our time to try to figure out how to learn how the transformation should be done. So having said all of that, we've been here for three years. We have prolonged the rent of the house. We're going to continue. We've just laid out the new kind of uh, things we're going to do for, for this year and onwards. And in essence, that means that first of all, we have focused more on the, the corporates and we've listened to the what they want. And one of the things we now do is to allow them to sit here like startups with their own projects. It's going to be very interesting. I'm waiting for the first one to sign up for that. I think that's a, f that's a fantastic experiment. I think that's going to be great. Some of the large companies told me that, you know, we, we know exactly what to develop. We have the right guys. We have the funding ready. Everything is there. And then we kill them by putting them at home, you know, in, in, in among the others. So I think that is, uh, that is absolutely great. We also taken away a couple of the focus areas where we're focusing on. Uh, before it was IoT, wearables, uh, automation, sensors, 3D scanning, printing, and robotics. Uh -huh. Now, we actually have taken away a couple of those and now we have brought sustainability to the room. So we have now bringing, we're now bringing all the, the, the forest kind of industries here. We have five or six of them here already. We're bringing all the big electricity companies and power companies here as well. So that's kind of what we do. The next big thing here is uh, the three-year event where we have a, a, a the anniversary party, 300 people in the room. I hope you're invited. And, and on our new website, you will see also all the open events that we throw. So it's a lot of open events like this one and others uh, that you can follow on our web. With that, fine. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening. So uh, <coughs> Magnus and uh, his uh, co-founder Stina. Is Stina still, still up here? Oh, I meant Linda. Sorry. Now there's uh, too many people. So Stina just started to work with Magnus and with uh, Linda. Is Stina or Linda still here? Either one. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, Linda and Magnus really helped uh, get this uh, event started uh, two years ago and uh, very appreciative uh, of it and uh, it still uh, runs, so that's really great. Um, cool. Next up, um, did um, Stina, did you want it to go now or did you want to go later? Because she also wanted to get rolling quickly. Nope. Okay, Lisa, why don't you uh, get rolling? Do you want to? Okay, please uh, welcome Lisa to the stage and I'll help uh, with the gear. Before start, uh, I've been in innovations and hardware since '94, uh, helping our family company to grow and a strong brand in 50 countries. Uh, it's called Baby Bjorn. But since 2007, sorry, I, I don't know why I does that. It's <laughs> so awesome. It's already awesome. <laughs> Uh, 2007, uh, I wanted to start a new company, and I realized that you know me as a marketing person, and that's my strength. I needed uh, some person or company or something that actually had the innovations, the hardware. So I was starting to look for a mind, uh, and I found found a mind. Mind, next, oh, do, do I need to do <laughs> that? <laughs> okay. Which one do oh, I just search you say arrows in there. Okay. So in 2007, I met Beckett Cologne, and I realized his mind was filled with uh, patentable uh, innovations in skateboarding and I realized there hasn't been inno inno any innovations really uh, for ages uh, or actually more or less from the beginning in this industry. So I got totally excited and together with Beckett who's mostly on his computer <laughs> inventing stuff and that's actually from a recording from the ride channel. Um, uh, since I met him, we have uh, put uh, the products both on the market and uh, into uh, patent and patent applications. So we already have six patent, uh, patent pending products. Uh, one of them is actually uh, a solution to mill and print products. And this is a super broad patent so uh, uh, there are now a lot of people uh, kind of excited about what you can do uh, uh, with this robotic solution because you cannot only print on skateboards but actually on aircrafts or whatever and as you know they're already doing it but uh, we have the patent <laughs> Uh, skateboarding is a spectator sport and all these events uh, make skateboarding even more visible uh, and bring it live uh, uh, to the public. And um, it's now becoming an official Olymp Olympic sport in Tokyo 2020. So you can imagine, you know, all these nations now, they need to get teams. Uh, so people in India, in Africa, in China, everyone needs to you know, get a skateboard and to learn how to skate. And we are there to, to support them. And we also have good collaborations with uh, uh, the US at this and a lot of Brazilian uh, companies and European companies and uh, working with them to do cool stuff. And it's not only uh, in real life, it's also online. I wanted to show you a one minute. Oh, so 
and that's when we get this uh, full page. Yes. Okay. Actually, thanks to Magnus uh, here at Things, we met with the Zilla Studios, and they thought it was uh, such a cool product, so they did this uh, video for us. How do I get back to the? Uh, so, we, uh, you know, we are doing skateboard decks for pro brands and uh, pro riders. So this is Mike Diaz, a super uh, famous guy in Brazil who is riding uh, on tip technology and winning the big competitions in Brazil. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, we care about the innovations and you care about the graphics, or some of you at least, both the riders and um, the brands and companies that actually want to reach out to the next generation. Uh, so we are helping brands that want to you know, reach out in social media and um, you know, actually get more brand awareness. So, we uh, did a collaboration with Lufthansa and uh, 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 together we strengthened Lufthansa uh, as a brand because the next generation don't really know or didn't really know what Lufthansa was about. Uh, so like making online and in real life events, uh, we made them more popular. So we, you know, love to talk with both pros and companies and anyone who want to do collaborations, because it's like great if you have good innovations in your mind, but uh, you know we want to help you get them out on the market. So you have my email address there if you want to reach out. Thanks. <laughs> I give this. And here's a gift for you. Do you want to switch over to the? Uh, oh, you want to put that in? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, switch to the uh, just the white screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll welcome uh, Mikael in just a moment. Uh, I think I came up with uh, uh, a way to uh, distribute these um, three pieces of hardware. So just to reiterate, we got a PPC micro bit, a particle photon, and an Arduino Uno. And uh, what I thought was uh, maybe between the next couple of breaks, um, we could just have a, a few people come up and explain what they're about, and if they do a good job, they get to keep it. How about that? Uh, because, uh, of course, this community is really about trying to understand what the different tools are, or that's part of what, what we'd like to do. So if somebody can come up and give a good explanation of what you can do with them, uh, you get to go home with it. We'll do one at a time, maybe, after the lightning talks. OK, cool. So now let's uh, mail welcome uh, Mike to the stage. Hello. 
Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I have an uh, announcement that I'm very proud and very happy for. Uh, so first, I would like to just say uh, it was very interesting with the, TED, uh, with the, the talk from TED from CES. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas out there, but all these ideas start somewhere. It's always in the minds of private or people at companies or private people. People have seen challenges somewhere in society for themselves or anywhere. Uh, and actually, there has been a study right recently in Lund. Oh, sorry. There has been a study recently in Lund that's shown that we in Sweden are consumer world masters in consumer innovation. And consumer innovation is uh, someone has uh, made, made a solution to a challenge, but only for themselves and not created a company out of it. So I think it's quite awesome that we are some, such an inventive uh, people that are doing that. Uh, so this is something that we want to harvest. Uh, so we have been two people, me and Sean, who is unfortunately sick today, uh, that have been working a couple of months here now uh, with a program that wants to harvest those innovations from, from um, people. So we started a nonprofit organization called ID Action and gathered a lot of different uh, actors in, th in the ecosystem of Stockholm. And we got funding as well. So we have Startup Stockholm, Open Lab, Toolspace, also Stockholm Hardware, uh, and a lot of other uh, supporting actors. And what we want to do is give people with hardware ideas a program that is suited to try out early hardware ideas. Uh, so I don't think I have time to go in exactly what, exactly what the support is. Uh, but what we do is that we have a 12-week program open for anyone uh, to support validating your ideas. There will be during 2018 uh, six groups of 10 people. You can go on the website and apply today. The first group which uh, would actually start on Monday. There's eight people having ideas, uh, hardware ideas, and it will be down here at Open Lab for, uh, for at least the first two months. Uh, what we do is that we supply with 30 plus seminars and private counselings uh, that supports its design thinking, its business counselling, its prototyping, early prototyping, is also patent, its uh, sustainable design, and there's a lot of seminars like that. Moreover, we give 500 plus hours also to co-working space, which is Open Lab at the beginning, and also uh, I call it simple prototyping, but uh, it's a 3D printers, laser cutters, and simple electronics lab, and then we will keep on building the lab as the program goes on and continues. Uh, as I said, it was, now it says 10 support organizations, but it's actually 12 support organizations today uh, that supports in, in all these things. And during, uh, during the time, we have been talking also with the Stockholm Hardware here, that everyone participating in the program they can also come here and announce during their uh, development also their needs. So, I mean, th there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of skillful people here. Uh, and hopefully, their, your network can support them in their struggle towards creating uh, their dreams and their, their companies. Uh, so, so uh, it's going to be during 2018. We're going to have lightning talks like this also from, from the people. Um, so, how do you do it? It's as always simple. Go in on idaction.se, it's open today. Uh, read the FAQs about the formal requirements also, um, because it's not, it's not for everyone, but you can read more about that. I don't think I have time to, to go through that today. And uh, simply apply. I mean, it's not, it's not more difficult than that. Um, but then I ha also have, uh, some things I want to ask you for, because uh, ID Action is a nonprofit organization. We have funding, but we also need more support. And I know there is a lot of skillful people here also today. Uh, so either if you want to uh, either participate, apply, uh, but also if you have skills or you want to, I know, I mean, Caroline, you have been running Arduino, and you have been running Arduino workshops. So if there's anyone that wants to just support these people uh, by running 
for example, Arduino workshops or, or 3D printing or being part of just the support through our Slack channels. Uh, I mean, please reach out. We would be more than happy. It's a l I would say also, it's a lot of really awesome, good ideas, the first batch. And I hope it continues. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. That was great. Thanks, Miguel. <coughs> okay, so um, let's see if I can plug this open. I thought maybe somebody, while, while I can't figure that out, I thought maybe somebody who knows what this is could come up and explain to everybody else what it is and what you can do with it. And uh, if, if, if people are happy with the explanation, you get to take it home. Anyone? Marek, you want to you do it? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, so the person who can explain what the Arduino is gets to get home the BBC micro bit. <laughs> okay, so nobody wants to take a go at the Arduino, then I take it home and I, I just bring it along next time. Max, come on, you can, do, you can always use an Arduino and it's not even a clone, it's a genuine Arduino. So if you any need, ever need to do a Photoshop or like a photo op, with your Arduino set up, you just switch this in, and it looks great. Okay, come on, Max. Let, let's hear. Let's hear what this thing is. Then, while you explain it, I'll try to open it. Can I open it, or do you want the box? Um, you want the box? No, I want the mixer. Okay. Uh, I have an Arduino. Uh, many Arduinos. Um, Arduino is like a small super brain that can make anything you want out of any sensor and any button. Yeah, coffee machines. Okay, Max, do you use Arduinos in your work? I use Arduinos all the time. I created um, music instruments, um, LED is strip things, um, um, like games, uh, a, a UFO, like a big UFO with uh, like a big LED. Um, Dome. That's yeah. Okay, is it okay? Is he approved? Does he get the micro bit with him? Um, Could you, uh, un do you want to unbox it? We'll have a look at it afterwards. Okay, so uh, who wants to come up and explain what the micro bit is and then pick one of these two to take home? I can tell what a micro bit is. Yeah? Really okay, all right. All right, you come. You get to pick which of these you want. This, I'm going to show you again. This is absolutely brilliant, and I'm so I, I'm astonished by how smart the BBC is. You know what the BBC is, right? It's the British Broadcasting. What does the C stand for? Corporation, exactly. And their mission—that's their mission statement from the government—is to make sure that the people of Great Britain are informed and up to date with what's happening. And back in the correct me if I'm wrong 80s, they thought, oh. For people to be up to date, we should not make stupid James Bond movies or like stupid TV series. We should make a computer. So they made the BBC microcomputer and just pushed it to schools. They spent TV money making sure schools have computers. And now, just like two or three years ago, two or three, three maybe four, they thought, oh, people have computers now. People know how to do software. Everybody knows how to do software. What's the next big thing? The next big thing is hardware. Like we know it here, right? We're the smart ones apparently. And the BBC just turned, came out and they said, hey everyone, now we're doing hardware. Here, take this. And every single school kid in Great Britain got one of these for free. Why aren't I, why aren't we school kids in Britain? Why aren't the SVTs? Exactly. Why doesn't SVT do this? We should have an SVT microbeat. <laughs> now everyone knows I don't speak Swedish. <laughs> well, talk. <laughs> photon. Okay, so the photon is. Uh, th does anyone know what the particle? Does anyone want to come up and explain what the particle photon is? Anyone? You do. Okay, you come up and explain what the photon is. Which one did you want to grab, Marek? The, 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 the photon or the Arduino? I think I grabbed it. Okay, I see. You come up here. Oh, that is perfect. You up here. Okay. 
Yeah, I actually have some hardware with me here, yeah. So actually I'm using a particle photon on this one to create an electrified, autonomous and connected robot. So that's a part of our flash talk here later, so you'll see it uh, more, but yeah. It's, a, it's like a plug and play out of the box uh, IoT device. So you get a web IDE and uh, a page where you can send up your data and publish and subscribe and add a lot of sensors and you have both uh, Wi-Fi uh, boards and uh, 3G boards. So yeah, a lot of different stuff. I think there's no discussion because not only did he know what it was, he, he has something that he built with it and he brought it along. <laughs> that's, a, that's a win. So you can take another photon or the Arduino board or whichever one you want. Okay, cool. That was... Um, improvised. And uh, if you have ideas on uh, how we should run the uh, hardware raffle giveaways uh, next time, I'd be happy to receive some ideas for a competition or prizes or whatever you think is good. That's a good idea. You can get the prize next time. That's a reward for the good idea. Uh, good ideas for what type of hardware we should get could also be fun. Okay. Um, who's next? Yeah? Maybe. All right. Let's do it. Do I need to... Okay, so please welcome Ola to the stage. Thank you, Thank you guys. Uh, my name is Ola Cornelius. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about a co-working space called H2. How many of you guys know about H2? Like three, four, five? H2. Yeah, so like ten people. Okay, cool. Uh, so H2 is, is a co-working space in a way innovation hub um, like this, but we do focus on health, health tech. Um, so digital innovation for promoting health and better life. Um, we started two years ago, um, and today we have, I think, 37 companies um, living in our our place um, and we have an amazing community with a lot of a lot of amazing people um, we have a very good atmosphere very very vibrant um, community uh, we also do have some some um, big partners so when it comes to hardware I think Samsung is the most interesting one and we also have some, some pharma companies. We have Bonnier, a media company, which is uh, interesting. That's our latest partner in H2. Um, I think they are going to do some interesting things together with, with some of our um, members. So that's really interesting. Um, but what we uh, want to do in, in this year, the new year, we want to build a lab. And we're... We don't have a lot of hardware companies. The most companies we have, the member companies, are software, so platform or apps or solutions that are kind of soft. We have a couple of hardware companies, but not so much. Uh, but we want to build a lab, <coughs> both a software and hardware lab. I mean, we need the hardware, we need the sensors, we need the VR, AR, whatever. Um, but we, I think what health is is a lot about knowledge and knowledge is data driven so so it's going to be a lot about software but what what we want in there is um, knowledge and people and solutions that that could be deep deep uh, ai uh, neural networks um, predictive analytics uh, but also vr ar um, blockchain and, and and things that that could be helpful but so wha what I would like is to invite people that have either a skill set or might represent a company that, that's interested in this, either a small company, might not be a health tech company, could be something else, but that could be applicable or interesting to be in an environment like this. And we want to build a collaborative environment where we can learn from each other. Um, but also bigger companies uh, would be interesting to have as partners in, in, in doing this. We have Samsung, um, but we I think it would be great to have some more hardware companies um, in this. So please come and talk to me if you have an idea or if you want to kind of collaborate in this. That's about it. Perfect. 
Thank you. Okay, so uh, I thought um, since we just had like a little uh, a little appetizer for your gear, uh, I thought uh, we could uh, next up welcome uh, Ulf and Joel to talk about the Robot Championships of 2018. Hello. Um, oh, yeah, the camera thing. Uh, so we're here to talk about uh, first our day job, uh, which is uh, building uh, autonomous trucks, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and no, thank you. Yeah, whatever. So we s I'll probably stand here so you can see me also. <laughs> yeah, so we sent out some uh, some robots to you. Um, they are examples of, of robots that you will see at our competition, Stockholm Robot Championship. It's a uh, yearly event that's been held for, I think, like seven years now. And um, uh, so it's in every year in, in November. If there's a lot of trouble here, yeah, whatever. Uh, so these robots uh, uh, are mine. Uh, they have uh, been competing since like 2013. Uh, they actually have uh, won a lot of the competition. I think they've placed top three at, at almost all competitions they've entered. So be careful with them. <laughs> and I want them back later also. Yeah. <laughs> Not all of them. So it's, it's an example of, of what you can do with uh, uh, Arduino and then 3D printing and then, yeah. It's very ho hardware uh, uh, close, so I think uh, for a lot of people here, it's it's really interesting to start to build uh, competitive robots uh, because you learn a lot. Because obviously there's uh, um, there's a fun moment with the with the competition. There's a lot of stress. Uh, there's a lot of yeah yeah a lot of stuff doesn't work. Also, uh, of course, they stop working at the competition day, so you have to be really stressed out and try to solder and, and do some really fast programming at the scene so I it's yeah it's, it's really giving so uh, a couple of quick words you see the competitions some of our main competitions flash by uh, on the next uh, slide uh, here uh, so we have uh, four main uh, classes it's mini sumo which is a sumo competition this is uh, really annoying uh, yeah, it yeah. is. Well, you keep talking. Yeah, okay. So, uh, mini sumo is basically sumo wrestling. Uh, so, you compete one on one and try to uh, push itso each other out of the ring. Uh, and it's uh, very intense. And uh, the matches are over in about a second. Uh, so, yeah, it's fun. Uh, we also have folk race, which is autonomous vehicles in small scale, about uh, one two hundred thousand of the thing we usually do. Um, and we have one going out there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, the goal is to navigate uh, a track uh, four at a time, and uh, the fastest one wins, uh, as you usually do in a race. Uh, and uh, we also have a smaller uh, scale, uh, the one that's uh, out in the um, uh, in the audience. Yeah, that is the electrified, autonomous, and connected uh, miniature 187th scale uh, truck, uh, which is uh, a new. <laughs> uh, so that is uh, a small scale uh, truck, uh, and uh, the rules in this competition is. Uh, um taken from the switch um, rules for vehicles in uh, traffic, public traffic, uh, and scale down to 187 scale. Um, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and uh, last but not least, yeah, there it is. Uh, so it doesn't hit stuff. That's good. Last but not least, we have uh, the classic uh, robotic ch uh, challenge uh, line following, uh, which is uh, a time trial, and you're supposed to follow a line on the floor uh, as fast as you can. Uh, and uh, yeah, it would be really awesome if some of you would either show up and watch everyone either win or fail, uh, or if you want to be participating, winning or failing. Uh, you're wer very welcome to uh, Technische Museet in November. So you have about, I don't know, 10 months? Yeah, uh, about. Uh, yeah, and also uh, during uh, this uh, later this spring, we will have a course where you will uh, uh, be able to build a mini sumo. Uh, so pro bono, uh, we will uh, uh, let you do this if you want to. <laughs> uh, and uh, for more information about that, you can check out uh, Stockholm Robot at uh, Facebook and also robotchampion.se. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, so um, who's left? Awesome, Max, Hilvi, and Sina. Uh, Hilvi, it looks like you're very uh, you're ready. You're ready to you're ready to get going. Cool. And then um, Max and Sina, and that's it, right? Oh, Nicholas too. Wow, what a amazing pack we have. Cool. So four speakers. Okay. So please welcome to the stage, Hilvi. Presentation. Right. Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Hedvig, and I'm one of the co founders of Stagecast. My co founder, Jonah, sits over there as well. Um, I'm here today to talk with you about our startup, Stagecast, but also about our Live Hacks, which is a hackathon that we host regularly for coders, designers, and makers. But first of all, Stagecast is what we call a live interaction platform for concerts. So if we all think about the last time we went to a concert last time, it's very likely it looks something like this. Okay, thank you. We want to utilize the fact that everyone are carrying around phones today by making the experience smarter and less distracting to engage the audience through their phones both before, during, and after a concert experience. We do so by offering a platform to artists and event producers where they can decide how they would like to communicate and interact with their fans both before, during and after. So they could decide about different programs which we call moments, which is all about how phones should behave and act during a performance. So that can be anything from sending a simple message before the show starts or deciding at what certain rhythm all phones should start flashing in the same time or allowing the audience for a certain time to affect the backdrop of the stage performance behind the artist. But we figured pretty early on that we're far off from the only ones who can think about exciting things to do with both mobile technology, but with other technologies in a live entertainment setting. And that's why we started hosting Live Hacks, uh, which is a hackathon where we work upon exactly these challenges of how we perceive technology in a live setting. So we invite coders, designers, and makers to come together for a full day to co-create upon how we can revolutionize the live entertainment sphere. And I want to show you a video of how such an event can look like. Now, more than ever, it's really important that people cooperate and work in teams. We need to bring together people that really have very niche expertise and have enough general knowledge to communicate with each other. Live events are, are getting transformed. It's already one of the most important aspects of the, the music industry with the collapse of physical sales of records. And so live events have been a very big supporting factor in keeping the music industry afloat. Live is not immune either to the changes in technology and interactivity has to be a part of live 
uh, venues. It, it, it just has to be because that's what the public is going to demand in the future. They want to be part of the process. They don't want to be passive. They don't want to just be an audience anymore. Uh, they want to be participants. And so um, interactivity and technology are going to be key in making that happen. The event itself is very structured, but the feeling is also very raw and messy and kind of creative. Like you can do anything and you can do whatever. Inspirational place. It's been a lot of fun out there. the video from our first one and now as I said we will have the third one on the 3rd of February where we will be at Reakta Hallen which is just next door from here 25 meters below ground um, and if you think that this sounds something interesting and fun you can go to our website livehex.io and apply either as a coder designer or maker or if you just think this sounds really exciting and you would like to stop by during the day please come talk to me or to Jonas and I'm sure we can figure something else out other than that, I want to thank you for hosting me here today and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, so, Max, Sina, and uh, Nicholas, who uh, do you want to fight over it or who, go who goes next? Max. Yes. Um, okay. There is a adapter cable somewhere. Why don't we, if it's right there, then let's do it. Yeah, is it? You got it. You got it over there. Max got it over there. Um, okay, cool. Was it, uh, was it Hokan Litbo that I saw in that video there? From life hacks? No. Yes. Was uh, Hokan in the life hacks video? Yes. So uh, Ho I think uh, Hokan and Max uh, works together uh, a lot. Here we go. Okay, well now uh, Max didn't get any applause, so please welcome Max to the stage. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be like me getting a lot of things out and talking about an experience. So. Uh, last year, we built an exhibition at Technopolis, a uh, technical museum in Mechelen, north of Brussels. Uh, it's 600 square meters or larger. Uh, it was hard to grasp the, the thing. And we made seven installations and drove down there with a, with a car we rented from uh, CK or something. St new Stato. Stato. Uh, drove down with everything and said one week there we're gonna make everything work and you go home and celebrate the uh, Christmas and everything so we went down had everything packed all the hardware was like soldered and s sort of prepared and got down and then everything started to fail on different aspects all the time it was they had the floor on the museum was made of uh, metal and like, like some kind of carpet that created a lot of static electricity. So we had sensors going all the way, couldn't read anything, and we went home after a week and nothing worked. So we went back and back, and I think we were finished the 21st of December. thing we learned here was on the preparation of um, 
building hardware that can be maintained. We often do installations where we do one-offs, so we do one installation and we build it and it just works for maybe a couple of months or just a day or a year, but this time with seven it became maybe too much. So I have a video uh, showing a lot of the installations, so I'm gonna show it and uh, see how much time we have for uh, more questions. So that carpet, the sensors, was yeah, all over the place. And that was uh, 500 LEDs in a series. And one of them broke. Yeah. On my way to the airport. That's a huge drum machine. Uh, it was uh, at Orlando for a couple of months, I think. And this one became one of the most like hardest things, you know, time consuming to get the um, it's consumer TV, so they don't start up when you plug the power. And the museum needs to start up by just pressing the power on. So we had to create sort of like a hackish solution where we cut the power like it's a power breaking breakout, and then the TV will start up again because it's got sort of like built-in functions to start up again after a, a, a power breakout. Let's see if we have the music through here soon. This one here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it works with uh, microphones sensing when people uh, punch the pipes and then it plays out the uh, musical rhythms. The problem is right next to it, it was an installation with footballs. So you, you shoot shot the, the football at a wall and each time this football hit the wall, it triggered all the sensors. So it took three tr trips to come up with a solution which was sort of working. It works. It works very good. And this one here, uh, you can see like the glitches in LEDs from the um, yeah, static electricity all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, so that was <laughs> compressed. Okay, cool. Uh, Nicholas, uh, so you know you uh, you are ready to uh, round us off uh, afterwards. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, let's see if I can. Do I have a deck here for you, Nicholas? Yeah. Okay, let me find that for you.
Okay, so please welcome to the stage Nick Les to talk about virtual reality. So, um, how many here thinks that BCI, brain computer interaction stuff, is cool? Most of you heard of it. That's a good crowd. Um, how many of you think that AR, augmented reality with glasses and stuff, is cool? All right. Great to see so many people into VR here um, because those things are also VR. It's <laughs> great. Um, so, <laughs> presentation up in three, two, one. Here. Wow. <laughs> Who's good at hardware here? By the way, um, so if you if you're into those things and you want and you're also cool with what Ted talked about at CES, uh, we have four thousand two hundred words of um, VR and AR focused stuff on VR Sverige. If you want to read about that, um, so that's that's what it's going to be about. Um, VR Sverige. Basically, what we do is every mor morning we find the five or ten coolest news about what's happening in VR, AR, and we collect those links. Uh, every week we aggregate them into our newsletter and uh, send out the coolest stuff. And we also run, like, do deeper uh, articles about the trends and uh, actually how to adopt these early technologies. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, <laughs> that's interesting pagination there. Um <laughs> Or is it just a big button? No, I don't know. Fantastic. So we so we did we did this uh, prediction in uh, end of 2016. What's going to happen this year, or last year? Um, so just uh, what what was our score here? The first one was we're going to stop talking about VR, AR, MR, and just start talking about immersive. That happened kind of because uh, Google is starting to talk about immersive computing. Facebook is, t is starting to talk about immersive um, tech, etc. So on a higher level, it's adopted, but uh, widely, most people still talk about VR, AR. And of course, AR happened and kind of VR sank in hype, whereas um, AR. So that was like a half a point there. Massive VR push from Hollywood didn't really happen yet um, because it's going to happen this year with Ready Player One. But uh, there's definitely been lots of movie promotions via VR uh, during last year. Um, and like things like IMAX doing uh, VR arcades in the US. So like a half point there. Apple gets into immersive. That happened big time. So big yes there. Um, VR arcades will be huge. Mm, kind of half happened. Um, it's still growing, it's huge in Asia, it's uh, coming up. Um, there's lots of small places in uh, the US and EU and uh, some cool big arcades coming up. So half point there. Social mobile will define the VR giants, definitely happened. HTC uh, invested in VR chat, which blew up. Uh, Facebook uh, released uh, Facebook Spaces with Oculus. Um, Microsoft bought Altspace, which is a social VR platform. So everyone's going social for VR because that's a, the biggest problem you need to solve. O everyone's also going mobile. Um, HTC is doing standalone. Micro uh, Microsoft is doing, of course, the HoloLens and uh, like going mobile with their tech. Facebook is going mobile. So that was three and a half points out of five for, from 2017. <laughs> well, let's do so this is for 2018. It's going to be all about standalone. W how does VR reach the main masses? Well, the big problem is it's big, it's bulky, it's, it's uh, expensive, it's com complicated to set up. So from this, these huge computer setups, let's remove the sensors so you don't have like things on stands standing in the room or bolted on the walls. Remove those, remove the whole computer, put everything in the headset. Um, that's what's happening this year. It's coming out from everyone. Oculus Go for 200 bucks soon. Um, 
HTC s ha has a one for 600 bucks. Lenovo Google Daydream has one for 400 bucks. So it's going to be way more accessible. Um, AR headsets will not overtake mobile AR. So this year, Magic Leap 1 is coming, uh, which is cool. It's not going to be uh, done yet when it comes. It's going to be kind of what happened with Oculus Rift and Vibe. It's going to be an un enthusiast product. Mobile R AR is coming stronger, stronger than that. Uh, AR Kit is just about to be updated with some cool stuff with um, iOS 11.3. Uh, I just read like 10 minutes ago. And, and uh, so that will have more of a mind share. Um, but but AR is so, it's much earlier in the hype cycle and in the maturity than VR. They're eventually gon just both going to converge into the same thing. Enterprise slash arcade VR and consumer VR will split up. So right now, who is going to use the big, bulky, complex, expensive um, PC VR machines? I think that that's going to move into the enterprise and arcade space exclusively. I don't believe in Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. Um, for mass adoption. And uh, I think that consoles is where it's at for mass consumers and standalone. But uh, the heavy duty stuff will be purely for enterprise. Oculus Rift 2 announced with uh, like lots of high, uh, high end uh, components and specs and like much more expensive will come. And then lots of new sensors, components, alliances, standards. This is a maturing business. Uh, technology. So we need eye tracking. We need um, hand input. We need lots of stuff that's uh, still to come. Um, open standards where, where everything's just portable and accessible throughout platforms. So the platform wars kind of become, well, people can compete by, by merit and not by exclusivity. Um, and let's see in one year where we, where we are from these points. Um, lastly, just instead of going through these, if you want to write or contribute on the set site, uh, let me know. Um, if you want to get in touch, reach me that way. The phone number is obscured. Um, otherwise, sign up for the newsletter uh, on the slash Nyhetsbrev link. Just go to the website. And uh, looking forward to nerding out about VR AR with you guys. Thanks. Any questions? And uh, for questions, uh, grab Nicholas as he uh, moves. Because next up we have Sina. And uh, I think, Sina, you're the last speaker of the evening. And uh, Sina will talk to the uh, biolab at uh, Stockholm Makerspace. Is that right? Cool. Welcome, Sina. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is uh, Sina, and uh, I'm the founder of the Biolab. I think some of you were down there checking it out. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we are doing in this lab. Uh, so, you see this uh, petri dish, uh, and those are bacteria glowing, and uh, that's what we have done in the lab in the past. So what we've done in the past is that we have ha had some courses just teaching some basic lab techniques uh, to, to the members of make Makerspace. And uh, the things we have done is just basics like pipetting, teaching people to pipette, and uh, uh, cultivation uh, techniques for uh, bacteria, so growing bacteria. Uh, um, and also, as you saw in the previous image, those uh, glowing bacteria. We teach people how to modify bacteria. That's the first step, making them glow. Um, and uh, for f our plans during this year is, uh, is to continue with these basic uh, workshops. So if you're interested, you can become a member of Makerspace and do these uh, basic workshops. Uh, we will continue teaching people this. Uh, and also, we will. Uh, the new thing for this year will be that we also will teach people how to uh, do basic DNA analysis, 
Uh, and a common question I always get is like, can you do DNA al analysis uh, in a lab like this? And the answer is, of course we can. It's super simple. Um, and uh, the next question is like, also can I also look at my disease genes? And it's like, yeah, of course you can. Um, and um, but the question is like, do you want to? Uh, but of course you can do it. Um, and uh, another thing that we are looking into is the technology called uh, CRISPR. I don't know how many of you have he heard of this technology. Can oh, that's a lot of people. Uh, so this uh, technology uh, is basically revolutionizing uh, biotech right now. It, uh, you can basically uh, edit genes in a very precise way. Um, it's, uh, it's also kind of simple to use. So. We're taking a shot at that technique uh, during com during this year. Um, question is though, what does all of this have to do with hardware? Uh, and a lot because we are completely dependent on hardware to do everything uh, that I just talked about. Uh, so for example, if we want to do an analysis of DNA, we need uh, this thing called PCR, and uh, right now there's a, we're still dependent on hardware that there's a movement growing right now, uh, a hardware movement uh, where people are building uh, uh, hardware just for the lab. So there's an open source hardware movement just for lab equipment, and this is one of them. So in the image you see, uh, that's actually DNA that we have amplified, uh, copied up with the PCR technology. Um, so we need a lot of hardware. And we have these open source al alternatives, but they are not enough. We need a lot more. And so basically my job last year was to uh, go around to a lot of professional labs around in Stockholm and just collect equipment. Uh, they are actually working, most of them, but uh, some of them are not working. And that's um, where we need like hardware people. Uh, so, uh, so you're actually, you, you, you can contribute to the biohacking movement uh, if you have hardware knowledge. Uh, so what we're doing right now is that we are testing all of these uh, equipment uh, right now and just see which of them are working. And those that are not working, we try to fix them, but we don't have the best knowledge. We get some help from the rest of the people from Makerspace, but we need this hardware to work to be able to do, for example, CRISPR um, and DNA analysis and modifying bacteria and all of that. Um, so that's basically the hardware plans for, for us at the BioLab uh, this year. Um, so if you're interested in making things glow, you can come talk to me. And if you're interested in making uh, the hardware that makes things glow, you can also come talk, talk to me. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, I think we're at the end of the road. Uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, lightning talks and the two main talks. I think all that's left for me to say is um, see you next time uh, or uh, at one of the other events. So we are, we're doing a monthly event, and the next one, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, in February on Wednesday the 21st. Um, we're going to try to do monthly events going forward, and uh, we're going to try to have every third event be a workshop. So we would do work meetup this time, and then again in, in February we would do a meetup and then a workshop in March and so on and so forth. So um, hopefully that'll work out for this year. So that's uh, part of the plans for, for us for the year. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you soon.